good morning, dear friends. Good morning. I am so glad to worship with you today. Thankful for a church family that finds agreement around what we believe, why we're here on this planet, that we may together uh, give him more credit and more thanks than we could if we were just by ourselves. Wouldn't you agree? And it's a miracle that any church gets along with itself. Am I right? Today we're going to talk about the presence of Jesus and the importance of the presence of Jesus. And he said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there in the midst of them. Do you know that's true? You believe that's true? As we've gathered in the name of Christ, as we've lifted up his name, he promises to be there in the midst. That means between. So the person next to you is actually further away from you than Jesus Christ. Really something to think about, actually, to take literally that Jesus is present with us at all times. And I want us to really think about that. But what a miracle that we agree on certain things, don't you, don't you think? I heard a paraphrase of that very verse, the church constituting the Spirit of Christ and other people and, and so forth. And it went something like this, if two or three people can agree on anything, I'll show up just to see it. And that is the miracle of the church, and it's what holds the church together, is the presence of Jesus with us. Somehow, mysteriously, as we cross that line, as we receive the forgiveness of Christ, as we commit ourselves to him, somehow, as that happens wonderfully, his spirit lives inside of us. And then there's this other mysterious part that says, as we gather, he's in our midst as well. Don't overthink it. All of God is present in the smallest atom. You get it? I, I mean, we're never going to figure out this whole omniscience business. But isn't it profound and wonderful that as you've sang that song of praise, that you have the confidence that, that God is not too far away to hear you, that he knows you, that he cares. What an important thing for all of us. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 12, if you haven't already done so with the Bible. And I'm continuing through a series, we're on the fourth one, of Meridian Friends Church Core Values. And I think it's important for us to clarify these things, to help us see some of the bumpers or guardrails that will maybe keep us on track as we do what Mark has uh, very well said we want to do, and that's to bring the hope of Jesus to our neighbors. And Wow, a lot of busyness. We kept Mark busy today, wouldn't you say? <laughs> a lot of busyness, a lot of things. But there are certain values, there are certain goals that we have ahead of us that we want to make sure that we are true, true to as a church. A church isn't just about strategy, is it? A church isn't just about um, organization. It's a living thing. It's a relationship with God. And we want to be very careful to live within the priorities that God has set for us. So we began, of course, where we ought to, I think, about loving God. We, we went from there to loving people, and Jesus summarized all of the, the law and the prophets amount to that, don't they? I mean, if, if we're not loving God and loving people, we don't have to continue the list. Am I right? Last week, I talked to you about the importance of transformation. That because we love God and because we're extending love to other people, God is changing us. God willing, we're different than we were last week, aren't we? Our prayer is that we're a little bit more like Jesus. We're being conformed in the image of Christ. I pray and I hope that that continues to be true. This week I want to talk about the presence of Jesus with us in all that we do. Next week I'm going to talk about the priority of Scripture and how we don't have liberty to change that. <laughs> we're, we're bound and obligated in our faith to hang on to that and to abide in it. So I'm going to talk about that next week. But in a certain way, and I want to be really careful how I say this, the presence of Jesus and honoring the presence of Jesus comes first before honoring Scripture. And I know that sounds really dangerous. Believe me, it makes me nervous too. But isn't it true that if we fail to recognize the living Word of God in the written Word of God, then we don't understand the written Word of God. Because what is it there for? We'll talk about this next week. It's to bring us, to make us wise unto salvation. It's to bring us into a relationship with Him and from there to conform our lives. So if we miss Jesus, we miss it all. 
We'll get there next week. This morning's message is simple. Don't miss Jesus. He's here. He's with us now. And I think far too infrequently do we really pause to think about that. Isn't that ironic? Even though we're here for worship and we're a church, even though we're structured around the priority of worshiping God, it's so easy sometimes to get locked into a routine and not to be fully aware that, you know, actually God is here. Well, that apparently was the case for folks in the first century, the religious people. We're going to read about a group who are known as the Pharisees. They are experts in the law. They've done a lot of study and training. They're disciplined people. They're religious folks, kind of like us. And yet, Jesus is standing there right in their presence, and what do they do? They argue with him. (laughs) I want to invite you to stand with me as you're able with full awareness (laughs) that Jesus is present and with full hope that as we turn in the pages of Scripture that we want to be honoring to him. So I'm reading from Matthew chapter 12 to us religious folks. It's kind of a warning for us, isn't it? At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Don't you love that they try to tell God what his rules are all about? He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? There's some irony of that. They have read it. He entered the house of God. And he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read that the law and the, in the law and the priests on, I'm sorry, or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet they are innocent? Do you know any pastors that also work on Sunday? I tell you that something greater than the temple is present, is here If you'd known what these words meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful for us to heal on the Sabbath? I'll keep reading. Just don't worry. It's not up there. Just just listen. It's all right. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, you will not take hold of it. Would you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? I just wonder what what they thought as they heard these words. Why isn't it obvious to them? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to one man, stretch out your hand to the man. He stretched out his hand and it was completely restored just as sound as the other, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Talk about the opposite response to the presence of Jesus. (laughs) May we be people who do recognize him and honor him. Amen? Please be seated. You know, reading the pages of Scripture, I sometimes forget how radical Jesus really was in his day. I mean, he was unafraid. Why are the Pharisees bringing these things up? Because they're trying to trap him. They're intimidated by him. They're really not in pursuit of knowledge. They're trying to win. And Jesus says, you know, something greater than the temple is here. You know, in their world, that would have rocked their world would have changed everything to think that something greater than the temple of God, this this holy of holies place. And of course, they plotted to kill him. They're arguing with him about the many rules that they have. You know, they had no fewer than 39 different Sabbath rules. And one of them had to do with plucking the grains of head on the Sabbath. That was a violation. You weren't supposed to do that. And they've created a a very intricate system, organization, understanding of what it means to be a a God-fearing person.
person and to be devout. And yet, God so loved the world, he sent his only son into the world, and they missed it. Sometimes we think, you know, if only I lived in Bible times, faith would be really easy. I would see it all, and I would certainly believe it was easy for them. And yet, page after page of the Gospels, you see the opposite. Because of their preconceived ideas of who God is, the containers in their brains don't fit with who Jesus is in the flesh to them. And they don't understand it. And they miss his presence. And I wonder if that perhaps could speak to us as well. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go backwards on my slides. And sometimes this takes me back to the scrolling announcements. But if I do it slowly enough, maybe it won't. (laughs) But here's a fuller explanation of our core value on the presence of Jesus that we value. Jesus is present with us at all times. So obviously not just today. In daily activities, as much as during worship gatherings, as we grow in our faith, we learn to recognize the voice and leadership of Jesus. If you don't know, the Friends Church, Friends called themselves Friends, as we mentioned last week, John 15. You're my friends. If you do what I command, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends. We get it. We get it there. And the Friends are Quakers. We've been around for a very long time. 370 plus years. <laughs> Friends have been around a long time. And I kind of like that. You know, I wasn't raised in any church, and it just so happened that God brought me into the kingdom through a Quaker church and through a friend's church. I certainly didn't know they were Quakers when I came. I would have been even more intimidated if I had known that as a young person showing up without my family. But they lived that. They lived this loving God and loving people and honoring the presence of Jesus. They were humble, good people. And I think we know when we come into a group, whether they're sincere and authentic, I think we know whether we are loved and cared about. And I certainly felt all of those things. They embodied, in many ways, the presence of God that I so very much needed. If you don't know much about Quaker history. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it as I move on to uh, what Jesus had to say then about rules and how radical he was in saying, I'm greater than the temple. I know about the Sabbath. That's the shadow of something to come. Jesus had three things to say in response to the Pharisees that were trying to trap him. Verse 6, 7, and 8. And I want to just spend a little time with each one of these phrases and really think about what Jesus had to say about his presence being greater. And the first is that one. One greater than the temple is here. They didn't want to hear that. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I want to invite you to write this down. The presence of Jesus is more important than what we create to contain the presence of Jesus. I just want you to sit with that, think about it, decide if that's what Jesus is saying. (laughs) One greater than the temple is here. What was the temple for? It was to contain the glory of God. It was to ensure that God was with them. And they don't get it, but everything is about to change. The Holy Spirit is coming. Jesus is going to be the last sacrifice that's needed. It's what you did at the temple to cleanse, to to remove the barrier between sinful humanity and holy of holies and the presence of God. One greater than the temple is here. We have a lot of containers when it comes to the way we think about God. We really do. You know, in medieval times, the church had as many, I want to get this right, the church had as many, oh, here it is. Uh, I didn't write it down. Oh, here it is. No, I didn't write it down. (laughs) I'm going to say 30. If, if you listen to my Quaker teaching classes, much better notes than up here. But they had well over 30. Sacraments. Do you know what a sacrament is? So a sacrament, like communion, water baptism, but there are more. Sacraments symbolize the presence of God with us, correct? 
there are other views of sacraments, transubstantiation, that, that it actually accomplishes something for us spiritually when we do it physically. So when we swallow or when we're wet, when we're a hydraulic ceremony, something actually happens in the heavenlies that didn't happen unless we did that. But for the most part, we've come post-Reformation to the understanding that sacraments represent a spiritual reality that's otherwise invisible. And so they're helpful because they help us see, they help us experience, they help us understand in a fresh way to be involved in something. But they're dangerous also, aren't they? At least early Quakers always thought so. Because in some ways they can become a substitute for the reality. So they observed, what did I say, 370 years ago? They observed that people would receive communion, the wine and the wafer with regularity, but their lives weren't changed. And there's no evidence of transformation. There's no evidence of God actually working, even though they came to church every Sunday. Are you with me? <laughs> and it created a credibility problem for the church. It certainly created a credibility problem for them. And so they said, you know, if we, if we really have to, if we have to choose between the symbol and the reality, we really want to emphasize the reality for folks to understand that abiding in Jesus is a 24-7 thing. The, the, the transforming presence of Jesus is always with us. And in the same way that we hope to be changed by being immersed, we are changed when we're immersed in God's presence constantly, not as a once and for all induction. That, that, that's where friends came from. I just want you to understand that a little bit. Well, in 1440, the Catholic Church identified, narrowed it down from the medieval times. There it is, at least 30 sacraments. Narrowed it down to eight sacraments. Are you familiar with this? So, so that's a way of saying God is more especially present in this container versus the rest of life. Can you think of it with me that way? So those containers look like this. Baptism, confirmation, penance, indulgences. This is 1440. Eucharist, extreme unction, marriage, an ordination. I'm still kind of a sucker for the marriage one. I just want you to know. I'm thoroughly Quaker, but I really am a sucker for that one. <laughs> I think it's really important that you promise before God and those of us present that you do. <laughs> but there's no conflict with, with who I am as, Quaker, as a Quaker on that. I'll explain that in a second. But there's eight of them. It wasn't until the Reformation, which was just before the early Quakers. Did you know that? I mean, we're old. It, was, it, was, it wasn't until the Reformation that they narrowed this down to two. And their criteria for picking the two, Eucharist, which is wine and wafer or juice and wafer, and water baptism. Why? Because they saw those were biblical. Now, friends will cite John the Baptist saying, I'm unworthy to untie the sandals of the one who will baptize with fire. I can only baptize with water. They'll cite Paul saying, you know, I'm glad I didn't baptize you guys because now you're fighting over this because we make the external the important thing, right? What's important is the essential baptism of the Holy Spirit. What's essential is the constant communion that we have with Jesus. See, friends are known, this is our rap out there, you need to know this. Friends are known as that church that doesn't believe in sacraments. And I want to speak as a Quaker to say, actually, we believe in them very deeply. And that's why friends are reluctant to reduce the sanctity of the presence of God down to one or two activities. We believe in sacraments so heavily that, that, there, that there really aren't two sacraments. There aren't eight of them. There aren't 30 of them. There are 70 times seven. All of life is sacramental. All of life is to be lived out in the presence of Jesus. All of life, everything we do, every word you say, everything that you said to a loved one yesterday is on the test. It all counts. It's all part of God's work in our lives and through our lives. One greater than the temple is standing right here. So don't miss it just because there's a temple there. And this is easy to do. We tend to think in separate ways about God's presence versus the rest of our lives. But the presence of Jesus is more important than the containers that we create to convey the presence of Jesus. 
or to try to somehow preserve it. You know, the law was, was an intention to preserve faithfulness. And the Jewish faith added, by Jesus' day, the, the Talmud, the, the extra laws, the 600 laws that surrounded them, including the 39 that I mentioned about Sabbath laws. They had surrounded the Ten Commandments with so many other things. But one more important than the rules is here. How about that? We just don't want to miss the presence of Jesus. Do friends do baptism and communion? Absolutely. We're, we're willing. It, it varies among friends greatly. Um, okay, we have some friends. Come with me to Israel in 30 days, and I'll do it. <laughs> we do have some folks getting baptized in the Jordan River. Our youth pastor baptized someone last Saturday. It's, it's not that we don't. It's that we want to be very careful not to create a barrier. We don't want to create a barrier. And there's all kinds of churches that, that carry on this tradition since the Reformation, and we value that, and we love that. But we want to be a prophetic voice in society that helps folks understand. Just don't miss the main thing. Don't miss that it's only the invisible part, the reality part, the relationship with Jesus part, that's going to show up in your life. And, and the sacrament looks like this. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And gentleness, all those transformation things we talked about last week. That's where it shows up. If you want to symbolize your faith to the world so they can see it, let your life preach. I'm telling you, they don't miss it. If, if, if you are a loving person in a crabby situation, people notice it. If you're a joyful person in the midst of a very worrisome situation, if you're a patient person, these things represent what's going on on the inside that they can't see. And in the words of Peter, always be ready with an answer for the hope when they question you. <laughs> be ready. Be ready with the gospel. Be ready to explain this great difference that you're living out. The presence of Jesus, it's, it's primary. Everything else I have to say is secondary. But here it goes. I'll say it anyway. Two. Jesus says, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. Who are the guiltless here? What's well, the disciples picking the heads of grain? They want to get after them. Look what they're doing. Did you hold them to any standards, Jesus? Come on. Jesus actually used this quote of Hosea 6.6 6 on another occasion. It's when they were accusing him of being a friend of sinners. He had eaten in Matthew's house tax collector, a publican. Don't you know? And Jesus said this again. If you'd understood what this meant in Hosea, your prophets, you've read it, you know. <laughs> I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You wouldn't be asking me this. And, and he brings it out here as well. Religion is a poor substitute for love. And it's very simply what Jesus is after here. You know, the context of Hosea is that the, the Jewish people Back in the day, long ago, their, their common ancestors, Jesus, of course, is born into a Jewish family. He's raised with Jewish traditions. He observed all of the Passover and everything else, which is where communion comes from. He, he, he gets all that. He understands Hosea 6.6. 6. They're arguing with Jesus about Scripture. Not a smart thing to do. <laughs> and, and, he, and he says, if you had understood what even is in the Old Testament about mercy and, in, instead of sacrifice, burnt offerings, then you wouldn't have a problem with this. But, but they didn't. And he cites David eating the consecrated bread and, and, and those kind of things. They, they overlook those things. They don't ignore those things. But the background is, is that God's people are mixing their religion of God, their love of God, with idol worship. And Hosea calls them to the carpet on it in that book. It's pretty harsh. And, and he's saying to them, you're missing your primary love of God. Sure, you're still doing the things you're supposed to do with the sacrifices, like, you know, the religious things. But your heart isn't fully devoted to God. And, and God says, I'll have no idols in front of me. Isn't it ironic that we can make religion an idol? You ever thought of that? We, we look to it for security. We look to it for comfort. But when we miss the presence of Jesus in our religion... We miss it. If Jesus isn't everything and all the plans this church makes and what we do and who we are as an organization 
and, 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 and a collective group of people, if, if Jesus isn't primary, it's, it's all for nothing. If we miss the presence of Jesus today, it's for nothing. He's here. Aren't you thankful? He's here, and he's present to us. And by the way, he's present with you all the time. My everyday life is sacred. I want to offer this as an implication of everything that Jesus is saying here. My everyday life is sacred. I'm going to conclude with some comments about busyness, boredom, and boxes. Boxes are a big part of my life right now. Yes, sir. Bill is just in that process as well. <laughs> Are you all unpacked yet? Oh, you move when we do. That's right. That's right. Well, after 21 years, we found a different house. <laughs> and we're moving. We bought a different house. Are other houses on the market? <laughs> it's a terrible market. <laughs> Come see us. <laughs> we have lots of boxes right now. Everywhere. I want to talk about busyness, boredom, and boxes. Busyness has been tyrannical in the process of putting a house on a market. There's been a lot going on in our lives as well as our church. A lot to do. I told Teresa this the other day, and I mean it sincerely. Some, some of you are doing a Bible reading two-year program with us. Like 37 people are connected. And, and I keep chiming in there. Jesus is faithful to me. I don't know if I've ever been more excited to be a pastor than I am right now. And it's crazy because I'm busy. I'm profoundly grateful for the presence of Jesus in my life. I've had some emotional moments packing my garage of 21 years. Does that seem silly? But I keep all my kids' treasures on the walls. And they did get boxed. They're not being thrown away. And I thought about God's blessing and how he's changed my life and how I don't deserve any of that. I think about being part of the same church for 28 years. And what gift that is, what a treasure you are. And all of that's happened in the middle of busyness. I think it's possible in the middle of demanding portions of life, in the middle of too much to do, to realize that Jesus is present. I pray that you're experiencing it. You know, if you have a box and it's not full enough, you just stack it and then there's a gap like this to the top. And you close it and then you go to put other boxes on it. Do you know what happens to it? I found out this week. Because <laughs> we're stacking them high. <laughs> it was crushed. And there's something to that. Boredom. When your life isn't filled with the right things, it's not useful. When you really need it and you go to use it, it falls apart. You know, Self-indulgence sounds really good, just kind of emptying the load. But it makes us less functional. Now, over-busyness, that's not good either. If you overpack a box... And then you go to stack something on it. What happens then? It just topples. It doesn't crush, but it topples. Am I thinking too much about boxes? Am I preparing sermons while I'm packing? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm telling you, Jesus is present all the time. 
the real reason that I brought boxes here is because of the influence of an ancient person in the faith, Brother Lawrence. You heard of him? He's a monk centuries ago. He was assigned the duty in his monastery of washing the dishes. And there was a time when he felt like that duty was beneath him. You know, why do I have to wash the dishes? I want to do more important things. <laughs> but he felt that the Lord spoke to him about this simple task of washing dishes. And he realized that he could wash dishes to the glory of God. Most people, when they think about their lives, they think about, and there are many more than two, but they think about their everyday life on the one hand, and then they think about their spiritual life as a separate box. And Brother Lawrence taught us not to do that. He said that the work of sanctification is not about changing our activities as much as it is about doing them for God rather than for ourselves. I really think that's true. I really think he was on to something. He's pre-Quaker, by the way. He was really Quaker. He didn't know it. But in our everyday lives, I put objects in my box that represent some of the busyness or the boredom <laughs> of my life. And I began thinking about, if I were more intentional to include Jesus in every one of these, how much better they would be. A phone, well, don't need to say much more, right? Talk about a possible idol and an obsession in life. <laughs> Jesus is watching, okay? Oh, by the way, in my spiritual box, I have my church directory. That's spiritual, right? Everything you do with the committees and, you know, that's your church family, your small group. That's spiritual. I've got my Bible in here, of course. I hope that you do think of your quiet time and your Bible reading, which is so important as spiritual. But I don't have to convince you of that. I might have to convince you that the way you use the tools in your life really are. How about your wallet? You know, your wallet says so much. It has your identity in it. It has, oh, it has cards in it. <laughs> what you do with your money. And sometimes when it comes to money, we think of that in the, this is the everyday life box, and this is the spiritual life box. So if I do this, then I keep that. Am I right? And a lot of times, yeah. Right? A lot of times, well, yeah. But it doesn't work that way. All of this properly belongs to Jesus, wouldn't you say? Where our heart is, our treasure is also. The way we steward 100% of our resources matters. It's all part of our sanctification. It's not about just doing the religious duty, the minimum, and saying, then I do whatever I want. Am I right? It all matters. I have, <laughs> it's strange. What, what tools do you use at work? <laughs> You have your work life in there, what you do on the job. What if Jesus is working on sanctifying you with the obnoxious people that you might work with? What if that's a test of your character? What if that's a witness to somebody? What if they need to see the sacramental life that you have because of the abiding presence of Jesus that you're constantly soaking? Brother Lawrence made it his goal to constantly think about Jesus while he was washing the dishes. This is an ordinary activity of life, am I right? Right? I mean, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to wash some dishes this week. And I want you to think about this. How beautiful that Jesus stands next to you. What a good thing you're doing, perhaps, for someone else. What a time to pray for them. It's not a have to. It's what you get to do. Aren't you thankful for your food that you got to eat today? Aren't you grateful for God's provision on this plate? What an honor to be able to wash dishes. 
What an honor to take out the trash. I really mean it. <laughs> for whatever reason, a lot of years ago, we lived in a church-owned parsonage for seven years. And building our home, which we built 21 years ago, it was such a God provision. It was such a miracle. It felt like such a thing that every time I mowed the lawn in my house, this is where I'm emotional, I've given God thanks for you. And I've given God thanks for people in my life who brought me to Jesus. And I pray for some of the earliest ones while I'm mowing the lawn. And it is a Brother Lawrence thing. I did take a Christian classics. I had to read it. I loved it back in seminary. How about your parenthood? Do you ever need Jesus as a parent? <laughs> this may be an area where you already pray a lot. <laughs> or your grandparenthood. Teresa started uh, parents, um, it's not parents in touch, um, youth intercessory prayer partners. And she would say an old phrase out of the parents in touch. If you're not praying for your kids, mom and dad, who is? Love that. How intentional are we about the presence of Jesus when it comes to our family relationships? As a grandpa, how well do I do this with Brooks? Yeah, I want, I want my everyday life to show up, that who I am is different because of Jesus. I, I want my life to preach, and I want him to hear it from my lips often. He's loved by Parenting's hard, isn't it? You know, um, we could put marriage in this one too, right? Oh, I have a marriage one. There we go. <laughs> White was the thing. White tux? That was, that was for real back, it was, 1989. But you know, with your family, I find that if you don't have them on your heart, they're on your nerves. The people closest to us sometimes are the ones that we forget how sacred they are. They're containers, jars of clay, good song. They're containers of the presence of God. They're sacred, amazing, wonderful gifts in your life. And God does not want this day of Sabbath rest, of connection with family and Him, to love God, to love people. He doesn't want that to go by without us recognizing that. Precious people. But if we always keep it in this box, I think we forget it. We, we forget. It's easy to be cranky with people that are on your nerves, right? It's hard to do that with people that are on your heart. Pray for them. Um, a lot of prayer goes there. Your kids' sports, everything you want from them. How about, how about what you eat? Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't fit in the box. It's frozen pizza, but it is cauliflower crust. It's, it's a little bit healthy. Oh, why? It's the synchronism, I think, um, mixing. Um, so, yeah, how about what you eat? All of it matters. Or whether you fast as a discipline or, you know, what you put in your body. It, it's sacred. We just don't think of it that way. But it really is. The reality is not these compartmentalized boxes. Oh, I did have one more. It's kind of fun. Um, how about loving Jesus while you're driving? <laughs> you didn't know that was me behind you this week, did you? <laughs> Jesus sees it all. <laughs> how we treat each other. Friends, your everyday life is sacred. As you exit these doors... I want you to know Jesus is with you. I'm just going to close with prayer and invite us to move to a closing song. Would you stand with me as you're able? And I want to invite you to think about a box that you don't want Jesus to have access to.
I want to invite you to commit it to him right now. Jesus, one greater than the temple is here. And we've gathered to remember that. We've gathered to be reminded of this beautiful miracle that your presence. Lord, how I pray that you would help us to learn the discipline of constant prayer of recognizing that there isn't any part of my life that's not important to you. Jesus, here we are, surrendered wholly as best we can to give you the things that are unsettled or unboxed, <laughs> the things that are pressure, the things that are empty. Lord, you can direct our lives so much better than we can. As a church collectively, we don't want to do church and miss your presence. Lord, keep us on track, I pray. When it's so easy, perhaps, to just get involved in doing the same things or to feel discouraged in our work. Lord, we confess that our religion is no substitute for genuine and authentic love. Resist the legalism in us that so desires to just justify ourselves. And Lord, teach us that our lives are lived before you. And in that way, every part of our lives, everywhere we go this week, is important and it's sacred to you. We love you, Lord. We give ourselves afresh to you in Jesus' name. Amen.